Welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director. Today brings us the third installment of our fall series and our first remote conversation featuring Ken Burns and Isabel Wilkerson with Lynette Clementson moderating. First, I wanna thank our partners without whom this event would not have been possible. The event today is part of the University of Michigan Democracy and Debate theme semester with support from Wallace House and the University of Michigan Museum of Art. And a big thanks to our streaming partners, Detroit Public Television and PBS Books. Before we join our guests today, a few words of introduction. Our lens on history powerfully influences how we envision and shape the future. Today's conversation brings together two of our country's most accomplished storytellers, Ken Burns and Isabel Wilkerson, to discuss the complexities of the American narrative. Journalist Isabel Wilkerson was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama in 2016 for championing the stories of an unsung history. She is also the first African-American woman to win a Pulitzer Prize in journalism. Ken Burns, known to many of us, has been making documentary films for over 40 years. Since his Academy Award nominated Brooklyn Bridge in 1981, he has gone on to direct and produce some of the most acclaimed historical documentaries ever made. To lead the discussion today, we have a most capable guide, Lynette Clementson, director of Wallace House, the Knight Wallace Fellowships and Livingston Awards here at the University of Michigan. A longtime journalist, she was a correspondent for Newsweek Magazine, a national correspondent for the New York Times, and senior director of strategy and new initiatives at NPR. Here at Wallace House, she works to sustain and elevate the careers of journalists, foster civic engagement, and uphold the role of free press in a de democratic society. And now I will turn it over to Lynette Clementson to lead us forth. Over to you, Lynette. Hello, I'm Lynette Clementson, director of Wallace House. Thank you, Christina, for that introduction. And what a pleasure it is to be joined by two of our country's cherished storytellers, Ken Burns and Isabel Wilkerson. Lynette, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here today. I'm sorry that we're not in person uh, in Ann Arbor, but at our own remote locations. And I'm so honored to be here with uh, a person whose work I admire as much as anyone's. I think The Warmth of Other Suns is the best nonfiction book I've read. And uh, Cast is rearranging my molecules uh, right now uh, yeah. as we speak. And, and um, I, Isabel is one of my, my heroes. And I'm so happy that we could be together. I'm so thrilled uh, and, and humble and honored to, to be here uh, discussing uh, all that we are so devoted to in our individual work. Thank you so much for having me. I want to start with an expression of gratitude, which I'm sure many of our viewers joining us here today share, because the two of you, though neither of you is a historian, have devoted your careers to helping us document and understand our history as Americans. Some parts of that history have certainly been well known and embraced, but other parts of that history we know have been forgotten, submerged, or willfully distorted. And in a year like this one, a year in which we're facing challenges on so many fronts, having an honest conversation about our history, hopefully, can help guide us forward toward our shared goals and realities and solutions. So we're gonna start by sharing a bit of work from each of you and then just seeing where the conversation takes us. Um, Ken, I would like to start with you. I have to say that trying to prepare for a conversation with you is <laughs> overwhelming. Uh, and overwhelming, I think, is an understatement. You've been making films for 40 years, which amounts to hours upon hours upon hours of potential research. But for the purposes of this conversation, I'd like to start with your film, The Civil War, a nine part series that first aired in 1990. Um, the first episode in that series is called Simply the Cause. The film begins with Frederick Douglass discussing the contradictions in the promise and reality of America. And it ends with historian Barbara Fields in 1990 talking about how we are still fighting the Civil War. Uh, and those comments were in 1990, but I think if we were to 
ask her today, it would be the same in 2020. Let's just watch a clip of those two moments to get us started in the conversation. In thinking of America, I sometimes find myself admiring her bright blue sky, her grand old woods, her fertile fields, her beautiful rivers, her mighty lakes and star-crowned mountains. But my rapture is soon checked when I remember that all is cursed with the infernal spirit of slaveholding and wrong, when I remember that with the waters of her noblest rivers, the tears of my brethren are born to the ocean, disregarded and forgotten, that her most fertile fields drink daily of the warm blood of my outraged sisters, I am filled with unutterable loathing. Frederick Douglass. I think what we need to remember most of all is that the Civil War is not over until we today have done our part in fighting it, as well as understanding what happened when the Civil War generation fought it. William Faulkner. Uh, said once that history is not was, it's is. And what we need to remember about the Civil War is that the Civil War is in the present as well as in the past. The generation that fought the war, the generation that argued over the definition of the war, the generation that had to pay the price in blood, that had to pay the price in blasted hopes and a lost future, also established a standard that will not mean anything until we have finished the work. You can say, there's no such thing as slavery anymore. We're all citizens. But if we're all citizens, then we have a task to do to make sure that that, too, is not a joke. If some citizens live in houses and others live on the street, the Civil War is still going on. It's still to be fought, and regrettably, it can still be lost. Regrettably, it can still be lost. Um, that's as sobering an idea as any to end that reflection on. What do you think of when you see that clip, those clips um, in the context of today, Ken? Well, well, first of all, I'm tremendously honored to be, you know, joining Penny Stamps again and to be with you, Lynette, and particularly with Isabel, whose work, Warmth of Other Sons, is one of my favorite nonfictions and whose astonishing uh, cast is is just, uh, just rocking my world. Um, you know, there's a separation between that Frederick Douglass quote and uh, Barbara Fields of about 11 and a half hours. Uh, which is the story of the Civil War. There was about seven or eight minutes that preceded uh, Frederick Douglass's quote, the kind of introduction, the setting of the stage. And then there's a couple of minutes after Barbara. But I, I think in some ways um, it's most chilling at the end because um, obviously, particularly this year, the stakes have never been uh, higher with regard to her warning, uh, which is absolutely right. I think when we made the film, we felt the burden and the long shadow of a kind of popular conception of who we are. Uh, that was, at least in film, um, the two big mammoth towers that blocked out any um, sunlight was the birth of a nation and gone with the wind, both of which suggests that a homegrown terrorist organization, our Al-Qaeda, um, the Ku Klux Klan were somehow the heroes of this drama and the rescuers of it. And that slavery really had nothing to do with it, that African Americans preferred to be in slavery. And so for us to set the stage of the reality of slavery, particularly the chapter that will follow Frederick Douglass's quote, and then go through the whole thing, soup to nuts, and then come out at the end and remind people, I think of the most important thing, time is a human construct. You know, and human nature remains the same. 
And um, we're repeating these patterns and themes. You know, Mark Twain is supposed to have said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. If he did say that, it's a perfect way of understanding these kind of enduring themes and motifs that, that crop up. And there's a sense that it repeats, it never has, or that we're condemned to repeat what we don't remember, lovely, but not true. Um, it's just a sense that we had an opportunity, at least with that film now 30 years old, to remind people of the real stakes that in the South Carolina articles of secession, they didn't mention nullification or states' rights or economics, they mentioned slavery, period. That was the cause. And we've spent in the intervening years since the Civil War, forget about what led up to it, the compromises that permitted it to carry on. But we've, we've, we've lived the decades since the Civil War inventing this mythology and, and encrusting it with the barnacles of sentimentality and nostalgia. And it was our intention to just try to, at least for the beginning, see if you could scrape some of those off and give a reality of, of what it was like and a different view of America. Frederick Douglass is a devastating, devastating uh, comment on us, both the US and us. And Barbara is, of course, the warning, the warning. And it, it's still going on. We, we brought it out three years ago, a little bit over three years ago, when uh, Charlottesville happened. And it seemed kind of instantaneously fresh. And, and watching it again, just even now, uh, makes me want to weep for uh, my country, the, the same country that Frederick Douglass was concerned about, the same country that, that Barbara Fields is, was, is concerned about. This issue, the cause, is is of course a perfect pivot to Isabel's uh, most recent work. But your current book, Cast: The Origins of Our Discontent, which we all have with us here, that does something altogether different. Um, rather than bringing to life vibrant journeys, you are pushing us in Cast to grapple with something much more fundamental the hard-coded structure of our society, um, as Ken put it so succinctly, the cause, um, from its inception, likening our American system to a caste system akin to those in India and Nazi Germany. Um, what I found interesting about the early chapters of the book is I felt that maybe you were anticipating that readers might struggle with this argument. Uh, of seeing our system in this way. And so one of the things that you do early in the book to walk the readers into this notion is that you start by talking about the United States um, like an old house. And it's a very gentle way into a very difficult concept to wrestle with and a difficult way of seeing ourselves. And, I would love it if you could just read a bit of this section for us. I'd be happy to. I, I'd like to say first, though, how honored I am to be here and participating um, in this um, just so central and important conversation. Um, just watching those clips, uh, I was reminded of the magnificence of, of uh, Ken Burns' masterpiece, uh, which helped to essentially set the record straight on what the Civil War was really about. And I, I, I think that um, it stands as, as a testament to not only his brilliance, but also to how necessary this work still is. I'm reminded, um, speaking of Charlottesville, of just how far we have yet to go to get on the same page as Americans about our basic history. And that was one of the things that animated this, uh, this book that I've just done. And so I'm happy to, to read that section that you made mention of. America is an old house. We can never declare the work over. Wind, flood, drought, and human upheavals batter a structure that is already fighting whatever flaws were left unattended in the original foundation. When you live in an old house, you may not want to go into the basement after a storm to see what the rains have wrought. Choose not to look, however, at your own peril. The owner of an old house knows that whatever you are ignoring will never go away. Whatever is lurking will fester whether you choose to look or not. Ignorance is no protection from the consequences of an action. 
Whatever you are wishing away will gnaw at you until you gather the courage to face what you would rather not see. We in the developed world are like homeowners who inherited a house on a piece of land that is beautiful on the outside, but whose soil is unstable loam and rock, heaving and contracting over generations. Cracks patched, but the deeper ruptures waved away for decades, centuries even. Many people might rightly say, I had nothing to do with how this all started. I have nothing to do with the sins of the past. My ancestors never attacked indigenous people, never owned slaves. And yes, not one of us was here when this house was built. Our immediate ancestors may have had nothing to do with it, but here we are, the current occupants of a property with stress cracks and bowed walls and fissures built into the foundation. We are the heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We did not erect the uneven pillars or joists, but they are ours to deal with now. And any further deterioration is in fact on our hands. What's clear to me in reading both your book and, and rewatching Ken's films is that it's all there. The, our history is documented for, for us to access and think about. Um, and, and it's an act of will that we ignore it. Um, and so I would love to hear you talk about why you chose to walk the reader into this subject in this way, and, and maybe some of what you've encountered in trying to talk to people about this subject as you've been out um, discussing the book. Well, one of the, the goals of this is to, uh, to in, in, other, in some ways, hold our country up to the light um, and to try to see things that we otherwise might not see. I view myself, you know, this metaphor of the old house means that in my world here, my role is I'm the building inspector who is going and looking at the house very closely and delivering my report to the owners, <laughs> which is all of us. And so when you think of it that way, um, it's a reminder of what has gone before and what we're dealing with now and what might be necessary, what is necessary to move forward. But you can't fix what you can't see. You cannot repair what you don't acknowledge. And so all of this is an effort to try to say that the history is what we have to grapple with if there is any hope of really working through these things. Another metaphor in the book is the idea of when we go to the doctor. Um, you go to the doctor and before the doctor will even see you, they, they hand you this clipboard with all these pages on it. And on those pages are questions, questions about your medical history. And not just your history, but often your parents' history and your grandparents' history, because the doctor knows that he or she cannot begin to diagnose properly and accurately whatever it is that is ailing you, unless they know the history. So history is so central to how we go about our lives. We know how central it is with that. How much more important is it when it comes to dealing with our own country, particularly with the upheavals that we are currently experiencing? The other uh, uh, reason why I wanted to look more closely at the idea of caste is that with the first book, The Warmth of the Sons, I actually don't use the word racism, which is a word that is accurate to describe much of what we are experiencing um, now and in the past. But there is a, another way of looking at it, and I found that in, in researching the experiences of people during the Jim Crow South, where it was actually against a law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together in Birmingham, that's how extreme it was, and how often petty and specific some of the restrictions and boundaries were. I found that the word racism alone did not fully capture all that I was describing uh, and what they were enduring. And so I came to the use of the word caste in part, with, in part because um, it was capturing the, the hierarchy, the embedded ranking uh, of human value that was endemic to that world. It was also capturing all of the restrictions and the boundaries that were created that went beyond just how you feel, was beyond hate. Uh, or ill feeling. It was, it was about a structure of control over an entire group of people that in fact affected everyone wherever they happened to be on the caste system. And so I, was, I ended up uh, using a word that had been used by anthropologists who had gone into the Jim Crow South in the 1930s and 40s and had studied it in real time at the depth of that phenomenon. 
and uh, which, which of course went on for, for nearly a century after Reconstruction. And so they emerged from their research using the word caste, which is a reminder of the infrastructure of the divisions that have been created. And so that's how I came to the use of the word caste. And I think that it's particularly useful for us today because we have to acknowledge that there have been there has been progress from the time of of the Jim Crow South there has been legislation during the the 1960s but again a reminder that there was legislation there was civil rights legislation of the 1860s and 70s and then this the legislation of the 1960s and so uh, this is a reminder however that we are not living necessarily with the uh, the classical formal legal uh, you know, racism of, the, of, our, of our forefathers era. But we're living with the permutations with the mutation of this. We're living with this under the shadow of something that I'm describing as bigger than what we might have assumed it to be. And that is the embedded infrastructure that dates back to the founding of the country even before there was the United States uh, going back to the you know, colonial Virginia in which this, this bipolar hierarchy was created and that we've been living under it ever since. And so it's a, this is an examination of what we've inherited from the time of the colonial era. And, and it's so interesting that, you know, this book, of course, is a book that you finished not knowing what 2020 would in fact yes. be. As, as you look at this work this year, does it make you think differently uh, about any of the arguments that you made? No, in fact, I think that's one of the, um, a measure of the um, authenticity of a work of storytelling, um, speaking to, to Ken's um, in, enduring um, universal and uh, profound work, that if it is authentic and, and rooted in truth, then it will be, it will, it will, it will uh, show itself to be accurate um, regardless of the circumstances. I mean, I did not know, uh, didn't, just, did not know as I was working on this, you know, for, for years, had no idea that what would, what would happen in 2020. Um, it, it, it so happened that I was, there was enough time to insert a little bit about COVID-19, but it was not written with an eye toward that. It's written as a history um, of how we got to where we are. The subtitle is the origins of our discontent. So if the origin, the origins are there, that these are the origins and whatever ensues beyond this is, uh, is an outgrowth of those origins, but the origins are, are there and they, they are part of our history. So I, I did not anticipate uh, what was going on now. I could not. In fact, what I write, is, what I do is not about the moment anyway. Um, these things have to be universal and, um, and in some ways timeless and applicable to any, any human situation. I mean, I, there's a question that people often ask about anything that they, a phenomenon that they don't understand or people's behavior that they don't understand. They'll say, why is it that those people are doing what they're doing? Mm -hmm. And my response to that is there's only one answer to that question. And that is what do human beings do? What do human beings do in that circumstance? Once you have thought about a research, what do human beings do in a particular circumstance, then the behaviors and responses of people begin to make a little bit more sense. It doesn't mean you agree, it just means that you are on the way to understanding. And so uh, what we've seen in 2020 with COVID-19 is has been in some ways a, uh, you know, a, a, a revelation, uh, it's been a revealing of this caste system that I'm describing, where you had people who are more likely to be at risk of, uh, of contracting, getting uh, sick, sickened by it, and then dying from it, were the people who were in the, what I would call the sub subjugated caste, the subordinated caste going back to, you know, for, for generations and centuries. The people who were on the front lines who were, uh, you know, uh, stacking, stacking the shelves in a grocery, the people who were driving buses, uh, people who were delivering packages uh, two people who had the luxury of being able to uh, shelter in place and thus putting themselves in greater risk of contracting the disease. So this is a, this is a continuum uh, that we're observing. And if the, if the if phenomenon that I'm describing is accurate, then you would see the, uh, the after effect, you would see the shadow under which we still live. And, and so that's what I think brings together all this work. The history is the history. And the question is, what can we do to get um, all of us on the same page about our history? And Ken, um, Isabel used this 
metaphor of a doctor's office and, and trying to create the narrative of your family history to better understand your ailment in a particular uh, moment. And you're doing something similar with a new project of yours um, called Unum. And, and it is, especially for people like me who uh, find themselves swimming in all of these films and trying to figure out which narrative to turn to for what, uh, Unum helps people interested in this putting together our narrative um, so that we can understand our current situation by, by taking clips, related clips from your various films and allowing people to, to absorb them on a continuum. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about UNUM and how the project works and, and what you hope people will do with it? Yeah, so first of all, let me just say that I don't think I've ever finished a film always in the distant past. I mean, I, I count on the fingers of one hand films that are within the last 20 years of, of when they were released. So what you'd call recent history, where I haven't been so completely stunned by how contemporary everything is. And this is what Isabel is talking about that I can finish the Civil War and, and Barbara Fields is resonant in 1990. You know, she's bringing up homelessness uh, in, a, in a particular way of expressing part of the decay of the house or part of the pathology at, in the doctor's office or whatever the moment was then, but it, it speaks and, and it clearly translates uh, to the present. And so this happens every film. And I, I promise that, you know, every time we make a film, it may take 10 years to work on it. The Vietnam series, I used to go out on the stump and say, you know, what if I told you I'd been making a film about mass demonstrations taking place all across the country against the current administration. The film came out in 2017 after a new administration came in the fall. And uh, it was about a White House in disarray, obsessed by leaks, about a president certain the press was making things up, about huge big document drops of stolen classified material that destabled the, stabilized the political situation, about asymmetrical warfare, and accusations that a political party reached out to a foreign power at the time of a national election to affect that election. All of those things were true about the Vietnam War when I began work in 2006. And all of them were still true when I finished the work uh, editorially, you know, we locked the editing in December of 2015, a month before Donald Trump uh, and faced his, the voters for the first time in the Iowa caucuses, out of which he was not supposed to emerge. And so you just are stunned at every film. And so gradually, we were trying to find a way to your question, Lynette, to try to curate what seemed to be evergreen themes in American history. It might be as simple about freedom and a tension between a collective freedom, what we want, we, what do we need, and, the, and, and, and personal freedom, what I want to do, and, and how those clash and, and sometimes support one another about race, of course, about hard times, about politics, about war, about uh, leadership, uh, art, innovation, all sorts of stuff. And so the idea is that this body of work, which as you point out, is takes weeks to watch, um, it has in it the seeds of a kind of guide, a, a, an index, if you will, to where we've been and the way in which you can connect the dots and understand the pathologies of two or three generations ago, uh, you know, take inherited diseases that sometimes skip a generation or move in and in one particular way, depending on uh, the nature of, of it. All of those things are present in, and as an anthropologist son, I'm happy to hear, and I'm, I'm so drawn to the use of the word cast, um, not only to give the title to the book, but meaning to the actual infrastructure that Isabel's talking about, because it also allows us to be free, at least partially, from these tropes that, as you suggest, Lynette, are weighing us down. Racism, and all of a sudden, the blinders are up and we can't talk but maybe by recasting it in a new light, no pun intended, you've got the opportunity to really uh, see anew. And so Unum is in a way um, an attempt to do that, to sort of draw connections and to say that 
you know, Ecclesiastes said, what has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. That suggests, as Isabel was just saying, that human nature doesn't change. And so we know that human nature relating to a certain set of circumstances will do this. You can study that. It's a sociological phenomenon. And we've got the history. We've got the facts just to back it up. And so if history does rhyme, then what better way than sort of charting these epic verses through the selection of things that help you get a certain perspective on the events of, of today and, and begin to understand they're part of a continuum. I mean, as a historian, in a funny way, you can't help but be optimistic, even in the face of all of the backward steps we take all the time, um, because there are aspects of human nature in which you hope that, that human beings can be appealed to, and at times they are appealed to. And so it, the storytelling, the narratives have as a, as a purpose to, to borrow from uh, Isabel's original reading, first reading, is that we have a beautiful house on the outside, you know, and we just need to do the actual work. You gotta go down into the basement when it's stuff. Look, I live in a house that was built in 1820. Everything you said is true. And the <laughs> metaphor holds so completely. And you just gotta go down there and you gotta say, we, we have to figure out what to do to stabilize this foundation, what to do to keep it from leaking, what to do to, as you say, you know, equalize those columns. Um, it's, it's a tough task, but it's, it, it, what I find so extraordinary in, in, the, in what I do, what gets me up every day is a sense of, you know, it's really bad right now. Right now, we are in the most desperate, I think, situation we've ever been in, in our country. Uh, it is hanging by the thread. And yet there's a sense, we can get through this, we can get through this. And there is, I think in Isabel's work, a fundamental sense in the first book of the hero's journey, the quest. How do, how do you get out, escape the specific gravity of that cast, of those circumstances? Are you gonna find yourself into that caste system in another place? Yes, but something's been moved. Uh, uh, molecules have been rearranged. And so too now we have the kind of blueprint of what the infrastructure uh, is that, that permits us to do that. And Unum is one modest variation of, I think, the huge, enormous service that Isabel has done for us with this magnificent new book. And we'll, we'll help people at the end um, learn how to find Unum. And I would really recommend people spend some time um, clicking through it and trying to put together narratives that uh, challenge your individual views on, on, on the points of our narrative and how we ended up where we are. But I would love to hear the two of you talk just a little bit more. Can you use this word optimism? Uh, <laughs> a challenging concept for people right now. But I think that that you don't mean optimism in a sort of Pollyanna-ish. No. No. It's okay. It's not that bad. Uh, I don't think that's what you're trying to say. Um, but there is a place for optimism that can help us move forward. And I would just like to hear you two talk to one another a little bit about what optimism might mean for you in a moment like this and how you, how you, how you can look at your work and glean slivers of light, you know, so, that might be coming in. So I, I do want to reiterate what I said. I think this is the most dangerous moment in the history of the United States in terms of its survival since its formation. Um, having said that, it is a tr also true that none of us get out of this alive. There is not going to be an exception made in your case or my case, and that we will live forever. We are all dying. And therefore, the human experiment is, ends in failure for each of us. And you could conceivably just be wrapped up in a fetal position, but we don't do that. We raise families and tend gardens and write books and, um, do all sorts of things. And that is a kind of what my friend Wynton Marsalis calls keeping the wolf by the door. You know, the blues is not a complaint. The blues is saying it is bad here in this caste system. But you know what? 
you don't get me, you don't own me in that way. And I think that the lessons of history throughout is for me, at least in American history, that's my bailiwick, have been to provide my storytelling because that's in fact what I am. And you pointed it out, neither of us are licensed academic historians. We just chosen that to practice our, our, our interests leads you to believe that there is for, forward progress, that history is a rising road, that it has the possibility of being better. And, and that's why we all keep going each day in the face of these things. And um, I do feel optimistic in the long run. In the short run, I'm scared <laughs> out of my wits, you know? Yeah, I would say that I would not have, I wouldn't put as much time into the work that I do if I didn't have some level of, I would say, hopefulness as opposed to maybe optimism. <laughs> the difference between those two words. Um, you know, I, I, one of the sons was 15 years, so I often say if it were a human being and be in high school and dating, that's how long I took on, on that book. And so you don't spend that much time on something if you don't think that there is something that can be gained from something that people that, you know, our country readers can gain from knowing something they might not have otherwise have known. Um, I, I gained some hopefulness from the response to the work and I can only begin to imagine the response that Ken's had to uh, the, you know, to, to the body of, of, uh, of filmmaking that, that is a, a testimony and archive in itself about our country's history, groundbreaking uh, in so many ways. So that one of the things I discovered once one of the sons came out, I uh, would hear time and time again from people, regardless of their background or uh, where in the country they might be, they would say to me time and time again, I had no idea. I would just hear it so often I could just sort of wait for the moment when someone would say it because they, you know, a fundamental, fundamental facts about the experiences of millions and upon millions of people had just not been known by so many others. And, um, you know, people said that to me time and time again. So it got to the point where I was viewing this book, you know, I was viewing this as in some ways, uh, if you think about it, if you don't know your history, then history itself is news. So that, you know, if, if, if the warmth of the suns, you might say, in, in my case, and I you know I, I can't speak for Ken, obviously, but I can imagine that people, you're hearing the same thing, is that, you know, people think it's history until they turn on the news. And then they're able to see the connections themselves. The goal of this is that until you know then you, you, in some ways, it's an unfair expectation that people act upon something that they don't know. The question is, what do you do when you do know? So the goal of this is, to, uh, uh, is an invitation, uh, as Ken uh, so beautifully said, it's an invitation um, to, uh, to, um, to, uh, to get to know more about one's country than we might have thought we know, had known. And without knowing, you can't act uh, with conviction or even with wisdom. I mean, this is a call for wisdom as we go forward. So I, I'm, I am, um, I'm hopeful that the knowledge that people gain from knowing their history can begin to affect how they see um, our fellow citizens and how they see uh, the country and how they see us as a species, in fact, and see that we all have so much more in common than we've been led to believe. Harry Truman said, the only thing that's really new is the history you don't know. I just, I mean, I, I think I read that in David McCullough's uh, masterful biography, but I, uh, I've i never forgotten how powerful uh, that is, that that it it, it, it it dovetails with what Barbara Fields just said and said 30 years ago, and actually 32 years ago, Lynette, when we actually did the interview, um, that history is not was, but is, quoting from Faulkner and many other people who understand the, the fact that it's just going on right now. And I think that it, it, what Isabel spoke to is a kind of existential thing. As you know more, as you accumulate knowledge, you are in a way a priori obligated to refine that knowledge into understanding or, or wisdom is the word that you used. And that's, that's, that's what we have to do. We have to take this experience. And my experience with every film that we've done is that I had no idea. 
people say that all the time. I had no idea. I had no idea. I had no idea about this. And, you know, we're working on a film now that it touches on uh, a great deal of Isabel's work on the history of the Holocaust in relationship to the United States, the way our, our systems and our infrastructures, Isabel would say, influenced uh, the Nazis. You know, we're, I'm doing a film on the history of um, the, from emancipation to, to the exodus. Um, that is about a period that people know nothing about. Reconstruction and the collapse of Reconstruction and the post-Reconstruction years and the first two decades of the 20th century, which were about as dangerous to African Americans as any other two decades in the history of the United States in terms of lynching and just out out and out brutality and and they echo all of the headlines that we can read today. This one of the things that also runs through your work. You you both use this term wisdom and this obligation, once you know an obligation to, to really th think about the history and how it's applied and find some way to act. I mean, one of the reasons we're having this conversation today um, at the University of Michigan, students are engaged in uh, what is being called the Democracy and Debate Theme Semester and trying to give young people tools for thinking about history and thinking about their power um, and how you put that to good use um, for the betterment of our democracy. And it's complicated because I think there's also a counter narrative um, that somehow to be, the word often used is patriotic, um, that you don't think critically about our structures and our systems and, and you don't, um, that you don't question. And you know, even in the weeks, Ken, in which I was going back to watch your films in preparation for this, this concept was introduced uh, through the news cycle of a push to uh, introduce what, what, what was being called patriotic education yeah. um, into, into the school system to somehow um, right the wrongs of students being taught a certain kind of history. And, and I thought about, you know, when I, when that, when that popped into the news and I was sort of deeply thinking about yes. so many of your films and rereading cast and looking at the warmth of other sons and, and, and thinking about the, the misuse and appropriation of this word patriotic and yeah. what it's being used for. Um, and, and you both take on this notion of questioning in, in your work. And Ken, I, I want to um, just spend a moment looking at a clip from your film on the Statue of Liberty. Um, when we think of, of the center of our democracy and again, of how we want to see ourselves as Americans, people often, you know, the Statue of Liberty is, is uh, is a symbol of, of, of who we want to be as Americans. And in your film, the writer James Baldwin talks eloquently about the Statue of Liberty, but about the myths that it helps us to perpetuate. And I would just like to, to watch a clip from that film and then talk about it for a moment. I suppose it occurs on two levels. One is inside, one is outside. So that finally, or first of all, perhaps, liberty is the individual passion or will to be free. But this passion, this will, is always contradicted by the necessities of the state. Everywhere. Well, as long as we've heard of mankind, as long as we've heard of states. I don't know if it'll be like that forever. It, for a black American, for a black inhabitant of this country, the Statue of Liberty is simply um, a very bitter joke. Meaning nothing to us. That's a film from the mid 
80s that I made, I was fortunate enough to meet and, and interview him. You know, that statue now has Emma Lazarus' poem at its base. It wasn't intended as a gift uh, to immigrants or to celebrate the immigrant experience. It was a gift from France to, originally it was going to be to Mrs. Lincoln, to celebrate the survival of the Union despite her husband's ultimate cost. No one said a word about welcoming immigrants at its, at its uh, inauguration in 1886. Um, and I do think we end up with these kind of false narratives of who we are and we begin to believe. Uh, the whole argument about the 1776 project to replace the 1619 is just a phony false dialectic. We don't need that. I mean, I've, I've, all my films have been about the US, um, but they're also been, as I suggested earlier, about us the two letter lowercase plural pronoun. And the thing that I've learned is there's no them. It's just us. And anybody who tells you there's a them, which is what these false narratives and these imposed uh, dichotomies suggest, they're wrong. Um, this new film on the Holocaust and um, the US will begin, I, at least right now, with, uh, we haven't gone, we're just in the early stages in the editing room with Emma Lazarus' poem. But by the end of the prologue, you'll hear the opposite, a poem by some people who believe that the doors should have been shut a long time before and to keep everybody out. And both of those are national poems. You know what I mean? We just know the Emma Lazarus one because we'd like to believe that. And what I think for us is, to in every subject that we investigate, to dive very, very deep in, into it and, and not look for that kind of, it's not like the, the cable news that feels obligated or used to feel obligated to invite the flat earth society in to discuss stuff. It's not a flat earth, right? Um, but we do want people who will take us on a different and more complicated journey. And, and James Baldwin, in the case of the Statue of Liberty film does that. It's not, apostasy for the sake of it. It's actually just trying to realize that we have so many competing and contradictory and overlapping and shared narratives that, that you can't contain it. And to suggest there could be a 1776 project that will go back to, you know, morning again in America with white picket fence is to forget that you know, going back to that political military narrative that American history is only the succession of presidential administrations uh, punctuated by these very heroic wars, belies the fact that more than a quarter, still to this day, more than a quarter of our presidents owned other human beings. You know, how can you not do that? Why is the 1619 Project in any way contradicting a 1776 project? I mean, it's just, it's just a false kind of political narrative to cry, try to create the false dialectic that there is a them amidst the us. And that's part of the reason why you construct casts to make sure that we, us, are separated from they, them. And uh, all of this is in the end kind of um, beside the point, particularly if you can reveal, as Isabel does, the architecture of it and particularly as both of us try to do is tell the intimate bottom-up stories as well as the top-down stories so that you're not just meeting the Jefferson Davises and Abraham Lincolns, but you're meeting the Elijah Hunt Rhodes and Sam Watkins of the story and uh, Spotswood Rice and Frederick Douglass. Isabel, in, in your work, um, in cast, you, you follow this journey and it is not just a backward looking uh, look at, at how, at the inception and how our society was structured, but at the tension that moves throughout our history as we wrestle with uh, this uh, kaleidoscope, right? And, and, and how we are looking through it and what, how we want that view uh, to be oriented. And there's a passage in the book where you talk about one of the points uh, that would be a more current manifestation of this tension that is in the James Baldwin clip about how people view Confederate monuments and what they represent to people. And this, this actual attempt to physically, you know, turn over the kaleidoscope. It's, it's, 
it's actually a great metaphor for this section of the book and it would be great to have you um, just read a bit of that. Yes, I'd, I'd be honored to. Um, so at two o'clock in the morning on April 24th, 2017, a SWAT team positioned its sharpshooters at strategic locations at a dangerous intersection in downtown New Orleans. Canine units patrolled the grounds and perimeter. At the center of the targeted area, men in face masks and bulletproof vests went about their perilous duty in the darkness. Others had refused to risk their lives for this, declined even to attempt the operation after the death threats and firebombing that preceded this moment. These men in face masks were the only ones willing to take up the mission. They were removing the first of four Confederate monuments in the city of New Orleans. Tensions had been building since 2015 when Mayor Mitch Landrieu, a fifth generation Louisiana whose ancestors had been in the state since before the Civil War, decided it was time for the Confederate statues to go. That June, a gunman inspired by the lost cause of the Confederacy massacred nine black parishioners as they prayed at the end of Bible study at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. The city tested the idea with the public in New Orleans. At one hearing, a Confederate sympathizer had to be escorted out by police after he cursed and gave the middle finger to the audience. A retired Lieutenant Colonel in the Marine Corps, Richard Westmoreland, came at it from another side. He stood up and said that Erwin Rommel was a great general, but there are no statues of Rommel in Germany. Quote, they are ashamed, unquote, he said. Quote, the question is, why aren't we? The city finally found a construction company willing to take on what had become hazard duty in a virtual war zone. It could be seen as karma that the only construction crew willing to risk their lives to, re to remove the Confederate statues was African American. Due to the dangers of the operation, the company charged four times what the city had anticipated to remove the, the three largest monuments and said the company would only go in if there was police protection. By now, the city had few other options if it wanted the statues gone. Mayor Landrieu gave a speech that day to remind citizens of why this needed to happen. Quote, these monuments celebrate a fictional sanitized confederacy, unquote, he said. Quote, ignoring the death, ignoring the enslavement, ignoring the terror that it actually stood for, unquote. They were more than mere statuary. Quote, they were created as political weapons, unquote, he would later write. Quote, part of an uh, effort to hide the truth, which is that the Confederacy was on the wrong side, not just of history, but of humanity. How do people react when you read that? Uh, you know, because this is very current. Uh, it's one thing to grapple with something that feels generations back that you can have some separation from. This is something that is happening right now and that people feel uh, deeply emotionally charged about regardless of which side you are on. And so how do you, how do you discuss this sort of this sort of thing, and again, this, this idea of myth and the kaleidoscope and, and how we can be patriotic and be optimistic and hopeful and wanna be moving toward um, the best version of us uh, and, and still want to change things. That is such a great, great question and so beautifully put. I mean, the question is, you know, who do we want to be but part of that, the answer to that is who do we, who have we, who do we think that we have been in the past? I mean, this, I realized that um, even as I was reading this uh, just now, and as I think about the work that went into this book and, and also Warmth, is that um, so much of this in, in, in some ways is not only about history and not knowing the history, but it's about memory of what people think they know. You think about Charlottesville, and that was not just about the history, it was about the memory of what has happened and how we remember things differently based upon what we've been exposed to and what we believe to have happened. And so it's not just, you know, getting people to, to know the history, but also how are we remembering the history. And I'm also, uh, you know, to tie in the idea of the kaleidoscope and also of the Statue of Liberty, 
it's also a question of what we are each seeing. You know, what are we focusing in on? I mean, we see the Statue of Liberty, um, Emma Lazarus' words, and then, but there's, a, there's an aspect of the statue that we don't look at as much, and that are the chains at the base of the feet um, that were, from the French perspective, also in uh, what, uh, what research I've done into the Statue of Liberty, I'm not an expert on the Statue of Liberty, but in the, that this, was, this came about as a sense of, of, of celebration by the French, by some of the French, of the end of enslavement, the end of the Civil War, the end of this all came up in the era of recognition that people were now being freed and that, the, that those chains, the broken chains, also were, represent freedom for humanity, but freedom for the people who've been enslaved. And so that is a question of like the kaleidoscope, the kaleidoscope, what is it that you see as the kaleidoscope turns? What are the, the, the colors and the, the uh, fragments that, uh, that attract one's eye as they look, as we're all looking at the same thing and certain people, we're seeing different things based upon our perspective. And then I'm also re reminded of you know, how this caste system came to be to, uh, to separate us um, by creating this bipolar system in which there were the, the dominant group on top, which would have been the English colonists to begin with, and then bringing in the um, enslaved people uh, to, from Africa to build the country after having decimated the numbers of, uh, of, of indigenous people and driving them from their own land. So this is the basis of where, where we happen to be. And in the ensuing decades, uh, generations and centuries after that originating uh, bipolar caste system was created, that meant that anyone entering this bipolar system then had to navigate and figure out where do they fit in. Um, and that has created tensions within this bipolar structure where people were arriving from, say, Poland or from, from Ireland or from, uh, from uh, what is now maybe Lithuania, wherever it might have been and arriving here and then having to shed their previous identities as Lithuanian or as Polish or as Irish, and then being assigned to a new category, a relatively new category in human history that's only five or so hundred years old, which is the idea of race. So they, were, they had to shed what they had previously been or seen themselves as, and then take on a new identity in order to, in order to navigate and to succeed in this new the world, the new country, their adopted land. And that meant people coming from other parts of the world also had to navigate and figure out where they, where they fit in. If they were coming in from Asia, coming in from South or Central uh, uh, America. So everyone having to fit into this pre-existing caste system. And this is all part of the kaleidoscope. Well, what is it that we're seeing? Where are people being uh, assigned? Um, how do people interact based upon their assignment? And then where is it that the history can come in to help explain how all of this happened? Uh, where does this all begin? And what can we learn from it? So I, I see all of this as interconnected always um, as we try to unpack and better understand you know, how we got here. Yeah, Ken said in the beginning of the conversation, he made a, a comment that you know, time is a, is a social construct. And you point out in the book, race is very much uh, social construct and and one that you know we we put the architecture around um, in in the framing of America and it's one of the things I worry about even in a conversation like this is that this notion especially when you start at slavery that you are entering into a bipolar conversation that is about this American struggle of black and white that people can today say, that is not about me. I don't, I don't fit into this struggle. I, you know, how do you, how do you pull all Americans into this concept of us and how this, um, how this system and the way people are pushed to identify with one end of the other of the spectrum. One of the pushbacks from the, um the monuments discussion of the last several years has been people um, a kind of uh, regressive idea that people complain that you're taking away my history when in fact it's actually enlarging the history it's saying look we've got a much bigger and wider and and really more interesting history and so i i've been spending a lot of time and and particularly redoubled since mother emmanuel myself 
uh, trying to address and trying to speak directly to people who, who see this in the purely black and white notions. Um, these symbols, as Isabel knows better than anyone, all went up, the, not just the statues, but the Confederate flag, which is not the flag of the Confederacy. It is not the flag that re was the flag of the Confederate States of America. It was one battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia, which is at one of at least a few armies uh, of the Confederacy. And it happened to be the battle flag that was adopted by the Ku Klux Klan in their night raids, period. So, you know, the statues went up in the 1880s and 90s for the most part. We all know exactly what's happening there. We're trying to back and fill from the mistake of how horrible Reconstruction is, right? That's the, that's the story that we're told. Reconstruction is, of course, a good period. It's a period when we're trying to enforce civil rights in the South. And um, the collapse is the tragedy, a backroom deal with Florida electors, can't make this stuff up, after an election in which the Democrat won the popular vote, but the Republican got to be president because of a backroom deal that said, you know, the quid pro quo is, we'll switch our votes if you remove the federal troops from the South. And so we enter this period. And these monuments are a way of celebrating the traitors who were at the head of the largest insurrection against the United States of America. As, as your Colonel Wilkinson says, Isabel, in, 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 in your quote. Um, and the same with the Confederate flag, that it was already worked in at that time into the Mississippi flag and finally now out. Uh, but it went into all the other flags of the Confederacy after 1954. And you go, well, why 1954? And you just look at people and say, well, what do you think happened in 1954? Brown versus Board of Education happened. And so you have, let's put in the Ku Klux Klan flag to say where we really stand. So none of this stuff is a really big argument. If that statue was up in 1865 or 1860, leave it. If it went up after the collapse of Reconstruction and or after the various periods where white supremacy is trying to brutally impose itself, not just over the old Confederacy, but there are lots of Confederate monuments, and I want to exempt those at the battlefields um, in, in, in the North as well. Um, they got to come down. They have to come down. And just doesn't, it doesn't work. You have to change the name of these bases. No African-American kid should go to a school named Robert E. Lee or Nathan Bedford Forrest or Jeb Stewart or anything like that. This pretty basic elemental kind of forward progress we can make. And this is in fact not taking away people's heritage. It's actually putting their heritage into a place in which everyone's heritage gets some, some voice, some skin in the game, no, no pun intended. I'm struck by what that, um, the, the man at that public hearing in New Orleans said. Um, he himself, as a Southerner, uh, as, as a white Southerner, recognized that in Germany, there are no statues to uh, the people who were part of the Third Reich. Um, there are many, many differences, of course, between the Third Reich and anything that, anything that happened in the United States, although um, it's been, you know, one of the things that I discovered in the course of working on this book was that um, there are connections, very, very disturbing connections having to do with the interaction between the American eugenicists and German eugenicists. German eugenicists actually uh, consulted with and were in dialogue with American eugenicists in the years and decades leading up to the Third Reich, um, that uh, German, that American eugenicists were writing books that were huge sellers in Germany and very, very much uh, beloved by the Nazis. And that's chilling to know. Of course, the Nazis needed no one to teach them how to hate, absolutely did not need to be taught that in, in any way. Um, but they actually uh, sent researchers to the United States uh, to uh, study the Jim Crow laws and the anti-miscegenation laws uh, that had been used to subjugate African Americans, the you know, subordinated caste in the United States. They sent researchers, the Nazis sent researchers to our country here to study what America had done to subjugate African Americans and uh, studied those laws and debated those laws as they were forming what would ultimately become the Nuremberg laws. This is just chilling um, and shocking to, to know that this is what the connection, uh, one of the connections that, uh, that we, that exists, um, that they were turning to the United States in the early years 
of the Reich as they were building it. And it's just shocking to, to realize that. Now you scroll many decades later and um, you know Germany has been wrestling with this. Germany has been um, uh, trying to uh, make sure that all of its citizens and its students, uh, young people all know the history. And they know the history so well, they've been working to atone for that history. And they have been doing it to such a degree that now in the center of Berlin, one of the major cities of the world, in the center of it, there is a monument uh, that takes up um, you know, several football fields large, that is uh, a monument to those who perished uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Holocaust, as, as it should be. What's so interesting about it is that there is no, there's no marking, there's no, there's nothing that, there's no display to explain what it is or what it, why this needed to be there. There's no explanation as to what happened and what this is uh, referring to. You just go and you see these, you know, these, uh, these blocks of, you know, of concrete blocks that are massive and they take up the entire you know, center of the city and, and you, it's not, you can't miss it. But there's, there is no need for description because people all know what it's there for. They're all on the same page about what's happened in the country. They all get the same um, messaging. Um, the, the, uh, the only, um, the, what has been used, what's been done with those, uh, anything related to, to that era um, the places of the Third Reich, the headquarters and various buildings have been all turned into museums, museums to educate and to enlighten and to record and to archive what had happened so that people from all over the world can come and see for themselves what happened so that this would never, ever, ever happen again as it should be, as, as the work should be. That is how they have wrestled with their history. That is how they have, um, have uh, diverted the memories of what happened into uh, 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 the use of education to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So you can see that there's a huge difference in, in how um, we have wrestled with our history and how well we actually know our history versus how they have wrestled with their own history. And I think that there are lessons for us in that. So many lessons. Uh, and, you know, as we start to, to pivot toward toward wrapping up this conversation and giving people some things to think about and act upon uh, as they leave this conversation. Can I, I wanna move to a more current project of yours. Um, it is a film that you were executive producer of called College Behind Bars that you made with Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein. And, and one of the subjects in this film, people are used to thinking of your work uh, as, as rooted in, in history. And, and this is a very contemporary film. And uh, one of the subjects in this film is a man named Rodney Spivery Jones. And at the time the film was made, he had been incarcerated for 17 years. And uh, the film explores people who are pursuing their degrees. And he's an amazing, thoughtful man. His thesis is titled, Messianic Black Bodies, um, and uh, it really moves us into the current moment. And I would love if we could just hear a little bit from, from Rodney and start to think about how we, how we direct people to move forward from this conversation. Ben Yamin says that we shouldn't look at history as linear, one event following another and then the other events are in the past. When he says messianic, he's saying that this past is constantly being resurrected. It's constantly re-emerging. Re well, when we take the black body, it's a container of all of this history of suffering and resistance. So we have a body of Mike Brown lying in the middle of the street for four and a half hours. But for many of the African-American activists who are seeing this body in the middle of the street, they're not just seeing Mike Brown. They're seeing all of the previous um, acts of, of um, indignities, injustice. And it's not just their personal experiences, but the entire quote unquote race. And I think Messianic Black Bodies, it allows me to explain why, again, why African Americans um, 
can look at a black body and say, listen, that is all of this history and it's me. So that's somebody wrestling with this tension, the myth of America, the promise of America. You can look at that clip and maybe feel dispirited. It certainly is a clip that speaks to a system of mass incarceration and changes that need to be made. But that's also a hopeful clip. Um, if, if, we, if we choose to think of it that way. And I'd just be interested when, when you two hear Rodney speak and you think about your own work, where does that lead you? Hmm. Well, first of all, it's to me very, very hopeful. Uh, you're right. Uh, this is a film that, that Lynn and Sarah made that is um, fully, you know, founded in the tragedies of mass incarceration and the disproportionate number of people of color in that system. Um, but here is an opportunity to sort of escape the specific gravity of that situation with a rigorous, extraordinarily rigorous uh, college uh, program started by Bard College. And um, Rodney is just spectacular. And again, he goes back to the theme of no time that you can look at Michael Brown, but you're seeing, as he says in another section of this thing, you know, all the names, Trayvon Martin, uh, Emmett Till, fill in the blank here. Um, and yet at the same time, you're looking at someone who has negotiated his way, if not physically out of that place, and Rodney is not yet out, um, but is, uh, has, has, has liberated himself already. And for me, I can't actually complete the film that I've described that one of the projects we're working on about emancipation to exodus without him. So he has a job when he gets out because I want his brain and his thesis is unbelievable uh, to help make sure that we tell this extraordinarily complicated, oh, I had no idea story well. And so um, I need Rodney on this side of the bars uh, before we can really go forward on that. Isabel, um, I want to give you a chance to, to comment on, on Rodney, but I would love to just close with um, just a final bit from cast as well. So if you could, if, if you have thoughts on uh, Rodney and what he's saying about identity and, and black bodies and our history and where that leads you and, and where that led you in your work. Uh, I think that one of the most powerful things out of the many, many powerful things that he says is, that, is just the line, fill in the blanks, because that's a reminder of how many people we have been, um, we have seen in just the last year in fact i mean just within the last months of you know people um let's see unarmed african americans dying before our very eyes i mean just dying before our very eyes and it's happening with such frequency um uh, that it is sadly shockingly uh, a matter of you know how to keep up with the names you know fill in the blank is just a a, a, a terrifying kind of you know, fact of dehumanization in itself, the fact that, that there's so many that, and I also would like to say that this is something that really dehumanizes all of us because we should not be, um, certainly these things should not be happening, but the idea that we um, have seen this play out, we've seen this so many times that we, my fear is that we become inured to this dehumanization before our very eyes because this is happening so frequently that we can grow numb to seeing the loss um, the bodies uh, against whom this violence is inflicted, but has been inflicted for so many generations, for centuries, in fact. And so this seems to be sort of a modern day permutation, a, a, a modern day manifestation of, of what we have seen um, for so long in our country's history. And I will read from a passage that's connected to this, if you wouldn't mind. I would love it. The vast majority of African Americans who lived in this land in the first 246 years of what is now the United States lived under the terror of people who had absolute power over their bodies and their very breath, subject to people who faced no sanction 
for any atrocity they could conjure. Quote, this fact is of great significance for the understanding of racial conflict, wrote the sociologist Guy B. Johnson, for it means that white people during the long period of slavery became accustomed to the idea of regulating Negro insolence and insubordination by force with the consent and approval of the law, unquote. Slavery so perverted the balance of power that it made the degradation of the subordinate caste seem normal and righteous. Quote, in the gentlest houses drifted now and then the sound of dragging chains and shackles, the bay of the hounds, the report of pistols on the trail of a runaway, unquote, wrote the Southern writer Wilbur J. Cash. Quote, and as the advertisements of the time incontestably prove, mutilation and the mark of the branding iron, unquote. The most respected and beneficent of society people oversaw forced labor camps that were politely called plantations, concentrated with hundreds of unprotected prisoners whose crime was that they were born with dark skin. Good and loving mothers and fathers, pillars of their communities, personally inflicted gruesome tortures upon their fellow human beings. Quote, for the horrors of the American Negro's life, unquote, wrote James Baldwin, quote, there has been almost no language, unquote. This was what the United States was for far longer than it was not. It is a measure of how long enslavement lasted in the United States that the year 2022 marks the first year that the United States will have been an independent nation for as long as slavery lasted on its soil. No current day adult will be alive in the year in which African Americans as a group have been free for as long as they have been enslaved. That will not come until the year 2111. That's incredible. Um, and it's something for us to think about. And I think, you know, on the one hand, it is a reminder that um, while certainly some of these things feel like a long time ago, we are very much in the midst of navigating our story and, and figuring out where we are in our history. And so maybe it is uh, not surprising, Ken, that, that this year feels so difficult and we are at such a crossroads. No, it's true. And uh, I think that that is, is the sobering and terrifying aspect uh, to all of this. And yet perhaps that's where the seed that you spoke a little while ago about what to do. I, I'd almost go back to the first voice we heard after yours, which was that of Frederick Douglass when I asked at the end of his life by a young man, you know, what he should do. And he said, agitate, agitate, agitate. And all that is, is just stirring it up writing an extraordinary book, trying to communicate bottom-up stories, trying to uh, rearrange the molecules of this kind of constant narrative that perpetuates the old forms and, you know, disrupt in, in that way and hopefully stop one of the fill in the blanks. You know, I, I'm, I'm here because um, we moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1963 because my mother was dying of cancer and my father had two job offers, one where there was a hospital, Michigan, and one where there wasn't. And so as an almost 10 year old boy, I moved here. And at the same time, I have been watching in our previous home and in Ann Arbor, the dogs and the fire hoses in Selma. And I conflated and confused the cancer that was killing my country with the cancer that was killing my family. And, and my mother died just um, a, a, a year and a half after we moved uh, anyway. And a good deal of what I've done has been to try to take the architecture of the atom and the architecture of the solar system and try to show the similarities and try to say that in the particular, William Blake, the romantic poet, you know, you could find the world in a grain of sand and that it is possible by telling these stories to, to get a sense of the larger um, way thing, the larger cosmology and the way things are constructed and to do it in an intimate way. And so 
you know, almost like judo, I've used the pain of loss at age 11 of my mother to begin an investigation of telling stories in the history of the United States that somehow permits us to both conflate the intimate with the general, but also to separate them in a way that we can struggle with this grief and come to terms with what's in the basement of our house. Well, agitate, 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 agitate. That's it. Isabel, I want to thank you for this beautiful book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. Um, and it is plural, plural discontents. Yes, it is. There are many. Um, and, and, and what it's calling us to grapple with. I think that so much um, of our society now uh, reinforces some sort of immediate response to things. And I think what I appreciate about both of your work is you're asking us to think about things deeply and to try to make connections. Uh, and Ken through Unum, uh, I hope that, uh, and we'll share on the screen here how people can, can go and look at this website, Unum, and try to make these connections so that we can find our place in our history and really think about how we got here and how we all have agency uh, in moving us forward. Um, I thank you both so much for your work. And uh, Isabel, I hope we don't have to wait 10 more years for, <laughs> for, for another book. Uh, and Ken, we will be looking forward to the new projects that you have in the works, many of them, uh, and hopefully see the two of you together again. I really thank you for being here together to talk about these issues with us. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you.